774. That's the number uh, that I received early this morning, the number of individuals in the state of California that are in ICU beds. That represents a 16.4% increase from the prior day. Uh, why do I start with the number 774? Because that's the number I wake up to that I'm most focused on as governor of the state of California, the number of people in ICU and the number of people hospitalized in the state of California. Those numbers represent our most urgent need in terms of keeping people alive and keeping people healthy and safe in the state of California. It is incumbent that we prepare for a surge in the number of hospitalizations and the number of ICU patients. That 774 may be deceiving. Many of you may think, well, that sounds relatively modest to what's happening in other parts of this country. And that may be true. But it's incredibly important to impress upon you that that number represents roughly a quadrupling compared to where we were just six days ago. The number of people hospitalized in the state of California, the number 1,855, represents roughly a tripling of where we were just six days ago. It gives you a sense of the nature of the spread and the nature of the attack of this virus and the nature of our focus as it relates to preparing for this surge. I'll remind you that we're preparing for a two-thirds increase in our hospital bed capacity in this state. Uh, we are preparing to meet that not just in terms of the physical needs within that system, but also making sure we have the appropriate protective gear, the ventilators, uh, and of course, personnel, people. I'll talk more about that in a moment. So today I want to go forward uh, with some more specifics about our modeling, about what those numbers that I've led with actually mean and mean to you and mean to the state of California. I'll ask Dr. Galley here in a moment uh, to provide an analysis of our current modeling, recognizing that our modeling is dynamic uh, and our modeling is unique to the state of California, uh, not necessarily trending with other parts of the country. Uh, we'll then talk about the issues of schools. As a parent, uh, that's top of my agenda and top of mind. Uh, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Superintendent of Public Education, Tony Thurman, and by Linda Darling-Hammond, the President of the State School Board. We'll also update uh, all of you on some guidance we have around uh, facial coverings. Uh, and then we will happily, of course, answer all questions you may have. But let me begin uh, with Dr. Galley and ask him to come up and share with you two slides that give you an overview uh, of the way we are conducting our planning exercises and how we are applying our prioritization as it relates to accessing resources uh, and give you a sense of where we think we're going over the course of the next number of weeks uh, and then well into May, uh, potentially June and July. Dr. Galley. Thank you, Governor. Uh, let me begin by reminding everybody what we're up against. We have a brand new virus to the globe. We've been watching it and tracking it over weeks and months now. And we know that we don't have treatment. We don't have treatment at scale. We don't have a vaccine. So the most important thing we can do is stay home and save lives. We've been talking for weeks about models. We've been talking about flattening the curve, and today I'm going to talk you through how California has been looking at it. I want to remind you that nearly three weeks ago, we began issuing guidance, first around limiting the number of people in mass gatherings, then a few days later, issuing guidance to protect our vulnerable population, seniors, those people who are homeless, those people with underlying conditions, and then a few days later, limiting mass gatherings even further as an indication that we were methodically and thoughtfully implementing physical distancing across the state. We then, on March 19th, issued the stay-at-home efforts across the state, augmenting what lots of local partners did as well. And it was all based on models and considerations that we've been tracking and thinking about since we learned about COVID-19, we welcomed Americans home on those repatriation flights. We took people in off cruise ships, and we prepared as a state for what we're facing today. So as the governor said, I'm going to walk you through two slides that demonstrate a bit of what we were up against if we did nothing, and then what we hope to be doing in terms of flattening that curve and changing 
the history of California as it relates to COVID-19. So on that first stay home effort statewide, we talked about the potential of millions of Californians being infected and the need for an extraordinary number of hospital beds. This black line here indicates our surge capacity. If you added that to our existing capacity in hospitals, we would just be above this 100,000 line. But if you see unmitigated, we would need over 700,000 hospital beds at peak. That's an extraordinary number that no perfect surge plan could ever deliver. So we began immediately talking about how do we flatten this curve? This is the curve that we were worried about. If we didn't do what the governor directed us to do early, which was consider all of the things to flatten it. Again, here is the same blue line if we would have done nothing. And you see it rapidly increases, even off the chart. This line here is where we project to be with our phase one surge plan. And if you add it to existing beds, we know that this baseline starts at about 75,000. This line represents 125,000 available beds across the state of California. When the governor speaks to two thirds increase, this is exactly the line where we hope to be. And I'll remind you that this line builds over time as well. And we are working hard with our local hospital partners, our local counties, our local labor unions, to make sure that we not only have the spaces for these beds, but also that we have the staff and supplies to meet the need. This purple line here looks at a model of what uh, California experiences if we do implement and implement well this stay at home effort. We know that throughout California, counties are doing an amazing job. People, individuals are doing an incredible job. I feel like I am joined by 40 million partners in this fight against COVID and we are grateful for everyone's effort. But I want to remind you that in order to keep this line and stay to it, we need to deliver on these efforts on physical distancing. And that means holding each other accountable, working within our communities to do all that we can do to stay home and save lives. I want to point out that even in this scenario, which is not the best case scenario, this is if we do what we are doing today, we do cross this line. Our effort is to move it as far to the right as possible so that we can ensure that we have the capacity in our healthcare delivery system, not just in hospital beds, but in ICU beds and ventilators. And the governor is absolutely right. We will need more and all of these things that we can accumulate. And that's why the efforts across the state, our efforts to procure as much as we can in terms of those supplies and ventilators is very key to our ability to not just move this to the right with our own personal efforts, but potentially lift this line as well. These line, these, uh, these uh, points on the graph demonstrate what we're experiencing today. These should not give people immediate hope. It tells us that we are doing in five or six days of data points with our hospital data that are we, do, we are doing about what we had hoped and expected. But because these models are highly variable, they change every single day, and there are a number of different models out there, Many of you are seeing them in other settings. We need to keep an eye on these very closely to make sure that we continue to track to the model. These are the actuals, this is the model. We are always at risk of having actuals exceed the model and we could cross this surge line sooner. And we need to do everything in our power to ensure that we keep this line as flat as we can and um, continue to support our communities in that effort. We will continue to be able to highlight where we are on this model and share that with you, give us feedback as a state on how we're doing in implementing those stay-at-home efforts, and it will help you understand when we bring out new considerations around um, on, on different elements of our stay-at-home effort. Uh, in order to make sure that we bring this line down as flat as we can and that our actuals track to that effort. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Governor.
Thank you, Doctor. So uh, it just reinforces the, the focus of our efforts. Again, the prioritization of our day-in-day uh, -day discussion interaction is the issue of hospitalizations and ICU beds. Roughly, hospitalizations to ICUs are running about 41, almost 42 percent. If you extrapolate that out based on the graph that was just provided in the model, uh, we'll exceed that phase one surge capacity of 50,000, somewhere in the middle uh, part of May. Uh, and if you get up to about 66,000, that's based upon our current modeling, we're looking at about 27,000 ICU beds uh, that we'll need to procure in this state. The good news is we have time, and that's why it's incumbent of all of us to utilize this time thoughtfully and judiciously. And what I mean by that, continue to practice safe physical distancing. Stay home, connect with others, make sure we're doing the neighbor to neighbor program, which we discussed yesterday, making sure we're checking in on our seniors, but no greater impact on changing that curve, buying us more time to prepare for this surge and for that peak uh, than physical distancing. And so that's the, the frame of reference that uh, we are providing today. I, just a note, we are over 8,155 individuals, uh, 8,155 uh, COVID positive cases. But the subset, again, is 1,855 hospitalized in the 774 that are in ICU that drive our planning focus disproportionately. With this new modeling, with the dynamic nature of the models that we've been using for now many, many weeks, uh, it seems, I think, uh, self-evident uh, that we should not prepare to bring our children back into the school setting. And that's why I was very pleased yesterday. We've been working collaboratively with the Superintendent of Public Education, Tony Thurman, and Lyndon Darling Hammond. Uh, I'm very pleased with the guidance the superintendent put out. Uh, I've been very honest with all of you for weeks now, my belief and my expectation. But I think based on that modeling, it should be clear uh, that the right thing to do uh, for our children, the right thing to do for the parents, uh, for households, for the communities in which they reside, uh, is to make sure that we are preparing today uh, to set our school system up where we are increasing class time, but increasing it at home and fulfilling our obligations through distance learning uh, and other mechanisms to make sure that we're educating our kids but not doing so physically on the school sites. Uh, and so I'm very pleased that we have the Superintendent of Public Education uh, here on the phone. And in a moment, uh, I'll turn it over to him. Uh, but with the expectation now that the school, schools will not reopen, but classes are in, uh, we also recognize our responsibility uh, to make sure uh, that we're not only educating our kids, but we're feeding our kids. And before I turn it over, I just want to make two quick announcements along those lines. Uh, we were very pleased to get a waiver from the federal government that will allow us to substantially increase access uh, to food distribution uh, throughout our public education system in the state. We've made great progress, but it's been inhibited uh, by the lack of uh, access to this waiver. We finally got that waiver, and that will allow us to more substantially provide points of access for grab-and-go meals and other meals uh, throughout our system. Number two, I was very pleased today with the great work of Tony Thurman, Ben Cheetah in my office, and others. We were able to advance a management labor agreement. Uh, this was a stubborn issue that manifested itself very differently in the 1,000-plus school districts throughout the state of California. Remember, this is the largest school system in the United States, America. Uh, we worked with management of all stripes and labor of all stripes to get a comprehensive agreement on protocols and procedures and processes to work through any differences that we may have in preparation and expectation to meet this moment and do the kind of work that's necessary uh, to advance our distance learning and to make sure that people are appropriately getting the resources and access to critical curricula related to homeschooling. In order to do that, we needed some private sector support. So today I'm also pleased to announce Google stepped up Google stepped up in a big way. Uh, Google announced today, or we're announcing today, uh, with Google, a partnership where they are providing 100,000 points of access to improve Wi-Fi and broadband capacity. 
uh, not only access to in the internet, but quality access to the internet. They're providing minimum three months free access uh, to high quality, uh, uh, well, to high quality access to broadband uh, throughout the state of California. Those 100,000 points will help us substantially address the digital divide issues, the rural issues, the equity issues that are at play, um, even in the best of times, but substantively are highlighted in these more difficult times. In addition to that, Google has announced thousands of Chromebooks that they'll also be making available for those that may say, well, that's wonderful. I have access to the internet now, but I don't have anything to connect it to. Uh, and so they will be providing uh, those uh, Chromebooks in addition to providing minimum three months unlimited uh, capacity at 100 plus thousand sites throughout the state of California. Uh, we need more Googles. Uh, we still have a little bit more coverage that we're going to need in some of the more remote parts of the state, but this was a substantial enhancement uh, that came just at the right time with the labor management agreement, with the federal waiver, uh, and with now uh, the expectation that schools will close. I just want to end by making one personal point, and that is as a parent of four, the oldest being 10, uh, this has been a very stressful time. And so for all the parents out there, millions of you, uh, that now may be very anxious about the expectation your school is not going to reopen. You may have thought that was the case, but you were waiting to hear clarity, which I hope we're providing now today. Uh, let me just express deep respect and empathy, and particularly for mothers. And let me just say this openly. Um, I try to do my part uh, as a parent, uh, but my wife does an heroic amount of work, and the pressure uh, that we have placed now additional pressure on caregivers and parents, particularly women and moms, is extraordinary. Moms are already carrying a disproportionate amount of weight in terms of managing the household. Moms are also working, and many of them are teachers themselves that are having to provide distance learning, having to cope with all the stress and anxiety, looking out for all of their kids they love dearly and making sure they're taking care of their own kids and their childcare needs and the like. Uh, and again, there's a gender reality connected to this. And I just wanna go deeply to express uh, an appreciation to all of the moms, all of those teachers, all those caregivers. I know how stressful this is, trust me, I know. And I know what we're asking of you over the course of the next few months. And I know you are looking forward to those graduations you were looking forward to seeing, you know, how well you did with the SAT and those grades and, and competitive environment, particularly for our seniors. And, and, and all of those things were working in real time. And that's why I'm going to turn it over to the superintendent and Linda Darling Hammond to talk about partnerships with the UCs, California State University system, uh, and our community college system uh, to address A through G requirements and address uh, the issues associated with the SATs and graduation. Uh, but we know. Uh, that those anxieties run deep and they are justifiable. Uh, and so the care uh, and the deep uh, empathy and collaboration you provide uh, at this moment um, will never be forgotten. And I just want to know how deeply proud I am of everybody uh, that is going to step in to the void with these schools being closed, but these classes now continuing uh, so that we can educate our kids despite uh, this challenging moment. And so with that, uh, if I could, ask uh, Tony Thurman, who's kind enough to join us uh, by phone uh, to amplify some of this. And I just want to thank the superintendent for his wonderful leadership and really helping navigate a system uh, that is the most challenging education system in terms of jurisdictional uh, uh, diversity of any in the United States of America. Tony. Uh, thank you, Governor. I'm just happy to uh, echo the sentiments that the governor and uh, his team have provided about how unprecedented these times are. And, and given the height of the challenge, how important it is for us to put forward maximum um, social distancing so that we can flatten the curve. And for those reasons, it is so important that our schools continue to do what they are doing, that our schools are using distance learning. What, what I mean by distance learning is simply that the teacher and the student are in different places so that our students can continue to get education, but done in a way that is safe. And uh, we've been in communication uh, with superintendents around the state 
urging all of our superintendents in our schools to uh, proceed as if um, we can only educate our kids through distance learning for the remainder of the school year. Quite frankly, none of us knows uh, when it's safe enough for our students to return to campus. We have to do the work that we heard Secretary Ghali talk about today um, to, to uh, you know, promote social distancing and flatten the curve. But out of an abundance of caution, uh, we believe it is most important that all of our schools uh, maximize their efforts around distance learning to help all of our students. Uh, we know that this is difficult. We know that this is a challenge. But as it relates to the education of our kids, we have to rise to that challenge. And so while right now our campuses are closed to our kids, school is not out for the year. In fact, we are asking everyone to accelerate their efforts to make sure that our students get a great education. As the governor indicated, we're working with a number of philanthropic leaders to make sure that we can provide devices and access to Wi-Fi for many of our students who don't have them. We're providing professional learning and training for our teachers and other educators on how do we do distance learning. Uh, tomorrow will be at 3 p.m. There will be, for anyone who's interested, there will be a webinar with a number of experts and teachers who are also experts on how we can deliver special education through distance learning. We have literally surveyed just about every school district in the state to ask what your technology needs are. The California Department of Education is providing training. We're working collaboratively with our higher education institutions, many of whom have already announced that they will accept work in a pass, not pass format so that our seniors will not be, uh, it won't be held against them that they're not able to take the SAT, that the SAT will no longer uh, be uh, used as criteria for admissions as was just announced today um, by the UC. We're working with our higher education uh, community to make sure that while we can't provide a graduation ceremony for our students, we can ensure that they graduate and that they move forward uh, on post-secondary educational opportunities. And so I want to thank the governor and his team. I want to thank the governor for his leadership. I want to encourage everyone to continue uh, social distancing. Uh, the California Department of Education will continue to provide support to any district that needs it uh, as it relates to distance learning. Um, this is a, a tough challenge, but as it relates to educating our kids, it's a challenge that we must meet. Uh, we can do more together. We're stronger together. And together, we will support the educational needs of our 6 million students. And if there are questions, we're happy to hear them at uh, CDE, uh, at covid19.cde.ca.gov, and we'll stay in this conversation. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. I appreciate uh, you joining us by phone. I'm also very grateful uh, that we have the President of the State Board of Education, Linda Darling-Hammond, who's on the phone. Uh, and Linda, I just want to ask you, and maybe you can give us a broad overview, the work you're doing to reinforce what the superintendent just say, that schools are closed, but classes are in. That just because the campus is closed doesn't mean we cannot accelerate learning in the state of California. Uh, perhaps you can amplify a little bit more on the distance learning efforts. Maybe a little bit more as well is about childcare needs within the system and a little bit on food distribution. Sure. Um, well, we've been working collaboratively uh, with the governor's office and the department uh, to help districts launch distance learning. Just about every district now is launching a distance learning plan if they had not done so earlier in March. Many were on break at that time and expecting to return, and uh, when it became clear that that wasn't going to happen, uh, districts have been uh, assertively getting out there purchasing and getting contributions of tens of thousands of hotspots and devices to do digital learning wherever possible. Uh, when we uh, went into school closure, about 20% of California students lack digital connectivity at home. Um, we're probably uh, cutting that by more than half at this point and we'll continue to um, continue to try to close the gap. I'm hopeful that uh, by the time we resume um, school-based uh, instruction, we will, in fact, have uh, uh, closed that digital gap and taught a lot of people, both kids and teachers and parents, how to engage in learning uh, online. But districts are also 
uh, where they don't have that connectivity yet using um, hard copy uh, packets for students, sending them out by school buses, you know, collecting them back. People have been extremely creative. Uh, AXA is collecting uh, on its website, the um, California School Administrators Association, uh, what the plans are that districts have, uh, and uh, the uh, some of them are also uh, that are strong models are on the COVID website that Tony mentioned, uh, and uh, so people can see what uh, good distance learning looks like in districts and county offices are sharing those with each other. Uh, I also want to note that today we'll be posting guidance of uh, State Board and California Department of Education on graduation requirements and grading that will make it clear how all students who are on track for graduation should be enabled to graduate. And I know some districts are going to hold those commencement ceremonies in the fall uh, or are hoping to. Uh, and further, the guidance will um, illustrate how students can and should be held harmless in grading, how their work can be acknowledged prior to the closure and um, continue to make progress uh, through the distance learning programs that are underway. We'll also be issuing later today a joint statement from the Department of Education, State Board, and our higher education partners, UC, CSU, community college systems, and the private nonprofit universities on solutions to a lot of the college admissions challenges that our juniors and seniors have been worrying about. Um, the colleges have agreed to accept uh, credit, no credit, or pass-fail grading where districts decide to use it for A through G courses and other courses during these recent quarters of the school year with no negative impact on student grade point averages. Colleges and universities are also extending a wide range of flexibilities for testing requirements, timing of payments, processes for transcripts, uh, reconsidering the needs for financial aid that students may have uh, because of changing circumstances of students and families. So uh, we're really pleased that everyone is joining arms and working together on behalf of the students. Uh, we are also, as you noted earlier, ensuring that students are getting fed. Uh, right now there are about 5,200 sites across the state offered by more than 850 districts and charter schools where students are getting grab-and-go meals or being fed in cafeterias. Uh, many districts have expanded uh, their provision of meals so that uh, all students under the age of 18 are getting served, or is all of those in schools uh, that are uh, Title I schools with more than half of students living in poverty. So we're getting as many people fed as possible. And as you noted, the federal government has approved our request for waivers um, to make um, this process of uh, food access even more extensive. Um, we do have a number of districts that are setting up child care centers. I know when Los Angeles um, closed physical buildings, they opened 40 child care centers uh, for the uh, children of first responders and other essential workers. San Francisco's done the same. This is a, a strong need um, throughout the state, and I would say that it's the place where we need to put our oar down for, you know, additional uh, intensive work. Uh, but districts are um, also organizing where they can and reaching out to other um, community partners, boys and girls clubs, YMCA, YWCAs, and others to be partners in the child care process. Um, and we have had some um, flexibilities in the rules to make it uh, possible for more people to um, engage in that support for our workers and um particularly our first responders and other essential workers. Thank you, Linda. And, and I should just note on the child care piece, uh, you've been working overtime with our team and the superintendent uh, to put out new guidelines, a little bit more prescriptive uh, and more regionalized guidelines on the child care space. I will be signing an executive order uh, in the next day or so uh, that lays out those uh, specific guidelines and strategies based upon the feedback you're providing us and the feedback you're getting uh, from folks all across the state of California. Uh, Thank you, both of you, for joining us today, and thank you both for your leadership, and thank you for meeting this moment. Uh, and again, my deep respect and admiration to all the mothers out there and all the parents uh, that I know uh, are going to have to do just a little bit more than even they've had to do. And again, as someone that's trying to homeschool uh, their children, trust me, I know how difficult 
it is. And so thank you uh, for doing that and everything else you are doing. Uh, in the spirit of doing more and doing better, uh, let me just update you on a few things that uh, I'm very uh, proud of. And that is uh, we now have over 34,000 people, 34,000 people that have signed up on our healthcore.ca.gov uh, website. Uh, this was the core we announced just two days ago. We had 25,000 applications yesterday, now over 34,000 applications. We're, again, reviewing them. Not every single individual uh, will be ready to go. Uh, we're looking at geography. We're looking at specialty. Uh, we're looking to make sure uh, the licensing uh, can be dealt with and appropriated according to the very detailed uh, specificity that we've uh, advanced as it relates to protocols for uh, making sure that people uh, are appropriately covered with insurance and making sure uh, that we have the professionalism that all of you expect. But again, 34,000 strong in just 48 hours uh, just is another example of people meeting the moment. And when I said we need more Googles, um, Linda Darling Hammond made a point. We did a survey, a vulnerability map of the entire state of California to provide confidently 100% coverage where that digital divide is eliminated, at least from broadband access. It's 162,013 hotspots that we would need. Google's already providing 100,000. We'll see how far that can go. And it was based that 162,000 number on a survey. So we think we're actually closer than even that survey may suggest. Uh, but those that want to participate, those who want to join this call uh, to meet this moment and address further the issues of equity, uh, please contact us. And, uh, we will make sure you're highlighted uh, and we'll make sure uh, that your good work uh, is distributed throughout the state of California in terms of just the hardware, not just the software, uh, to help accelerate the work that Linda uh, and Tony Thurman are doing. I want to just briefly, before we close and open up to questions, uh, ask Dr. Angel to come up uh, to talk a little bit about what we put out yesterday, which were uh, some, uh, well, broad strokes guidelines uh, on face coverings. A lot of discussion around face coverings, what they are, what they're not. Let me just begin by making this point. They are not a substitute uh, for physical distancing. They are not a substitute for a stay-at-home order. They are not a call to get folks to find N95 masks or surgical masks and pull them away or compete against our first responders, our frontline employees uh, within our hospital system or broadly within our care delivery system, be it assisted living, skilled nursing facilities, police fire, and the like. Uh, so face coverings broadly defined uh, can be additive but not a substitute to the social distancing, the physical distancing that is required of the moment to make that model mute and to make sure that we continue to bend that curve. And so with that, let me just ask Dr. Angel to come up briefly and uh, let folks know a little bit more about the guidelines we're putting out on the issues of facial coverings. Thank you, Governor. Just to reiterate well, as well, from an evidence perspective, our best defense against this virus is the types of implementation, interventions that we currently are putting in place and we must continue to reinforce. That is washing hands, physical distance, and staying at home as often and for as much time as possible. That prevents exposure to other individuals who could pass the infection to you. And secondly, our care delivery system must be protected because when people get sick, if we don't defend our care delivery system, it won't be there to save lives. So when we talk about face coverings, we think about that within our, that context. So there is some evidence that using face coverings may reduce uh, the trans, uh, asymptomatic infections, and also it might signal to others that you need to keep a little bit of distance. It does also work through, quite simply, decreasing the amount of infectious particles that go into the air when we cough or we sneeze or we talk, particularly when we speak closely to other people. But again, it doesn't replace the need for physical distancing. So when we speak about the potential downfalls, which we also must acknowledge, they can be that if people have these masks on, they feel somewhat immune. They feel like they can get closer to other people. And when they do so, they decrease that 
great evidence-based intervention that we have, which is physical distancing. The other challenge is that when people use these face masks, if they're not comfortable and they're not washing their hands, but they're touching the mask, the particles that they might get on their hands get onto their face, get into their eyes, and can infect them. So in short, there may be some benefit from using these, but only when they're used well. There are some counties that are introducing policies and recommendations around, or some counties introducing these recommendations, and, and they're being done so thoughtfully. And some of you, some of you who are listening and can use these face masks comfortably by still maintaining distance and by washing your hands and not touching your face may also get benefit from them. But in the end, the thing that we want to reinforce is that it, this really, the most important thing is physical distancing. And when that's done with some additional face coverings, you may indeed get some additional protection. We don't want people to have a false sense of security with these face coverings. That's the most important thing. So if you use them, make sure you maintain that physical distance. Thank you, Dr. Angel. And so those guidelines uh, are forthcoming. Check your inbox. Uh, we'll be putting them out uh, today. Uh, so that's broad strokes where we are, some modeling uh, that we are socializing more publicly. Uh, we have hospitalization numbers uh, by county in the state that also uh, we're putting out today. Uh, new guidelines on child care coming out in the next day or so. Uh, we'll continue to do more and better in terms of our efforts to match uh, the appropriate level of personal protective gear uh, that is required at this moment. We are again working all around the world to procure as much PPE as possible. I should just note uh, that we have distributed now 35.4 million N95 masks in the state of California, 35.4 million have been distributed. Those numbers go up on a daily basis. As soon as we get uh, new N95 masks in, we get them out. Again, I use N95s as a proxy for all of the other protective gear that is required, the coveralls, the gowns, uh, the glove sets, uh, and the shields, and the surgical masks, and the like. Uh, we have, in addition to that, I referenced this a few days ago, uh, we have received our first two and a half tranches of distribu distributed uh, supply from the federal government, the strategic national stockpile. Uh, we were just informed this morning uh, that the fourth tranche uh, is being sent to the state. Uh, we were pleased to hear that as well. Uh, that is on the PPE side, not on the ventilator side. I mentioned a different Partnerships we're trying to form around ventilators, which continues to be a top priority for us in the state of California. We have a few thousand we're procuring uh, from across the globe that are on their way, that have already been purchased. Uh, in addition to that, uh, working with private sector, uh, including uh, a conversation I had with the head of General Motors, uh, Mary Barra, and the work that they're doing on behalf of the president uh, as it relates to their production facilities and what that can mean in terms of the larger global supply domestically, that is, here in the United States and how California uh, can assert itself without getting in the way of other needs across the country. Uh, so with that, we'll happily answer any questions. Scott Schaefer, KQED. Uh, thanks, Governor. It's been a couple of weeks since your statewide social distancing order went into effect now, and it seems to be working. But, you know, as a parent, you probably know that after a while the kids don't take you as seriously when you say the same thing over and over. And given that this could go on for a month or longer, um, how do you think about calibrating your message to the public so it doesn't seem old without, you know, turning the state into a police state, which I'm sure you don't want to do? No, I, I mean, I look... Uh, Scott, it's the right question, and it's a very personal question, particularly for parents out there, um, and that is difficult. And look, I have young kids, it's difficult. I can imagine having teenagers may be even more difficult. And that's why we have to remind people of the power and potency of their individual decision making. Uh, the real leaders are individuals, uh, folks that are listening, that have the capacity to do something miraculous, and that's bend that curve. Uh, and go even lower, buy us even more time, quite literally save lives. And so it, it's really a civic moment. It's an opportunity to remind people of our common humanity. It's more than just rhetoric. It's more than just words. Uh, it's seen people exercise their civic duty and, and, and remind people uh, that, you know, we're all connected uh, and our decision-making has an impact on others. Uh, and so we're just 
doing our best in terms of messaging that. I, uh, I'll be a little more technical with you. Uh, we've been blessed by the overwhelming number of well-known celebrities, influencers, broadly defined, that have been doing PSAs, uh, some very formally uh, working with the state uh, and some informally uh, that also have a profound influence on reminding particularly younger people, people that aren't watching this news conference, of the importance of their decisions. And to the extent, as you suggest, we need to enforce uh, social um, Enforcement is the most powerful uh, and influential, meaning other people just pointing uh, bad behavior out uh, and encouraging people to do the right thing. But we've done these soft closures of our parks and beaches. It's just a reminder uh, to uh, keep your distance physically. And to the extent we have to continue to do even more on hard closures, we'll do that in order to continue to enforce. But we just got to remind people uh, to stay at home. And to the extent you're not working, and you're young, and you've finished all your schoolwork for the day and your homework to get ahead for the next day, um, you know, there's plenty available online to keep you occupied that, you know, for our grandparents didn't exist when they went to war and met this moment in an even deeper moment of anxiety for millions, billions of people around the world. Rachel Bluth, Kaiser Health News. Uh, hi, Governor. Thanks for taking my question. I actually have two for you. First, could you just clarify what's the total hospitalization and for at the peak and total patients expected in the ICU? And then also, uh, in New York, Governor Cuomo has used his authority to suspend supervision requirements for people like NPs, physician assistants, nurse anesthetists. Could you walk me through your decision not to do that, please? Yeah, I'll ask Dr. Galley to, to speak to both uh, more specifically, especially as it relates to the modeling here on that peak number. So again, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, we know that we have planned our phase one surge capacity at 50,000 beds. That is a monumental effort that we're depending on many partners to get to. Our modeling shows that we will need roughly 66,000 beds towards the end of May. And I'm careful to use towards the end of May not to signify the peak. We are actively looking at our actuals, these numbers here, to determine where and when that peak comes. And we are on our way to securing those 50,000 beds, ensuring that among those 50,000 beds, we are working to get about 40% because that's what our actual show in ICU beds. But let me remind you that because we don't have great medications, because we don't have a number of treatments, ventilators are key. And ICU beds without ventilators may not be worth as much as an ICU bed with a ventilator. So the governor's effort to bring as many ventilators to scale in California is a must. And that if we look at 40% of roughly that 66,000 or even that 50,000 number, we are in need of roughly you know, 20, 25, closer to 30,000 ICU beds and ventilators. And we are working hard to complement our existing um, ventilators with new ones. And then once we reach that goal, we will continue out to uh, identify more ventilators for the people of California. I will say, that these numbers here and our actuals are gonna be important to track because this model can be improved. If we continue to bring down the curve, bend it further down, we may be able to buy ourselves more time and ensure that we have the services both in ventilators, ICU beds, and other, um, other equipment and supplies to care for all those people who need it. With regards to the question um, on our uh, staffing and uh, flexing some of the credentials or knee, uh, the, the uh, scope of practice for uh, PAs, NPs, and others, we are closely looking at that. We are in, uh, enthusiastic that 34,000 individuals have registered on health cores, uh, uh, .ca. Our effort with the health core, can't even remember the name, sorry. Um, <laughs> But, but that is going to, um, as, we look at, as we look at those 34,000 individuals and identify where they can meet the surge capacity needs and the global need across the state, 
we may indeed need to look at other interventions to make sure our healthcare workforce is sufficient to meet the need as we model and look at our actuals over time. Healthcore.ca.gov. Um, we want to encourage even more folks. Look, we do things we think we need to do, and to the extent conditions change, we make decisions in real time. We are gaming out uh, dozens of other executive orders. Uh, we are analyzing legal protocols. All those things are, are considered as part uh, of our pandemic planning uh, that goes on here at the Office of Emergency Service every hour of every day. We are a completely different place than the state of New York. I want to just begin with that. And I hope we continue to be, but we won't unless people continue to practice physical distancing and do their part and we continue to meet this moment. I should remind all of you, it's important to remind all of you on ventilators. Uh, we have a phase one goal of 10,000 ventilators. Uh, we are already at 4,252 uh, that we've been able to secure. Uh, we believe there's thousands more that we'll be able to announce very shortly. We're also looking at bridge ventilators. Those are the ones I was referring to at Virgin Orbit, uh, which we are getting a prototype uh, delivered uh, uh, very soon here uh, to begin testing. We're also looking at CPAC machines and all kinds of other novel strategies we mentioned when we were down at Bloom Energy just a few days ago in partnership with Stanford University, looking at the utilization capacity of existing ventilators and seeing uh, if we can reduce the number of ventilators even being used on one patient. Oftentimes, you'll have two ventilators for one patient, depending on different lung capacity or the capacity, though this is a more challenging thing, uh, to get multiple patients on one ventilator. It gives you a sense, I hope, that we're not just looking to procure what's already on the line, 700 component parts, traditional uh, ventilator. We're trying to be very creative uh, so that we can meet this moment and get in that second phase, which is that 66,000 number, of which would require roughly 27,000 ICU beds based upon the current modeling of 41, 42% of all hospitalizations requiring ICU. Alexi Kosef, SF Chronicle. Hi, Governor. Um, you know, building on that point about trying to get more ventilators and other supplies, is there any sort of state authority that you have or have looked into about trying to uh, require manufacturers to make equipment the way the federal government can, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the uh, Defense Production Act? And separately, why has your administration stopped publicly reporting how many healthcare workers are infected with coronavirus as a um, as a separate data point from the total cases? Happy to happy to provide that information, and so we'll make sure that you get that information as it relates to doing a domestic version of the Defense uh, Production Act. The answer is yes, we have capacity to do things creatively uh, and to the extent necessary, uh, we'll advance them. Uh, but right now we're having incredibly strong collaborative spirit with companies, California-based companies, Virgin Orbit being a very specific example in Long Beach, Bloom Energy, a specific example in Sunnyvale of people that are contributing specifically to the issue of ventilators in real time. Jeff Taylor, Bloomberg News. Hi, Governor. Thanks a lot for taking our questions this afternoon. Um, so many, many um, aspects of policy have taken place, changes of policy have taken place that I think a lot of people find surprising. Um, the generous unemployment benefits, including for rideshare drivers and others laid off um, by the crisis, the ban on corporate stock buybacks from companies who borrow money from the government. I'm wondering if you see the potential as some others in your party do, for a new progressive era, if you want to call it that, in um, national politics and policy, and whether there's the opportunity for additionally progressive steps, um, such as the ones that I listed on the national and state level uh, going forward, you know, because of this crisis. Yeah, we've had some uh, very deep uh, policy conversations in this space now for weeks. Uh, let us remind, despite the fact that California was running uh, historic uh, economic output in terms of our GDP growth, in terms of our net, uh, well, from job creation to low unemployment to record reserves, surpluses, uh, the wealth 
uh, distribution, the income inequality uh, was not something that was substantially improving, and that's the case across the rest of the world. As IT and globalization detonate at the same time, you're seeing that concentration in fewer and fewer hands, the middle class feeling squeezed. Increasingly, the trend lines were suggesting what is self-evident become a headline, and that is we were going from a three-class society to a two-class society. So something was fundamentally flawed in that global context, manifested quite acutely here in the state of California, the richest and the poorest state with a number of the most impoverished metros in the country. And we've long been struggling to address those issues. So I see this quite uh, substantively through that lens, that equity lens, looking at those folks that never fully recovered. And you look at medium wages for folks uh, coming out of 08, 09 in the Great Recession that haven't fully recovered, even today that are struggling. Uh, and so what is going to happen to those folks in this current crisis? Uh, and what's the opportunity to your question uh, for reimagining uh, a more progressive era as it relates to uh, capitalism? And I'm, I'm a capitalist. I'm a small business owner. I'm a job creator. Well, my customers are the job creators. I'm a beneficiary of their support. Uh, and that helps build that demand that allows me to hire more people. And so as a former business owner, now governor, uh, I have had that experience and I have that appreciation of the importance uh, of consumer confidence, consumer spending, and a vibrant middle class. And so, yes, forgive me for being long-winded, uh, but absolutely we see this as an opportunity to reshape uh, the way we do business and how we govern. And that shouldn't put shivers up the spines of you know, one party or the other. I think it's an opportunity anew for both parties to come together and meet this moment and really start to think more systemically, not situationally, not just about getting out of this moment, but more sustainably and systemically to consider where we can go together this historic moment if we meet it at a national level and a state and subnational level. So answer is yes. Final question, Kathleen Renane, AP. Hi, Governor. Um, I actually have two questions for you. So the first one is um, on, on face masks. So Riverside County has put out recommendations that everyone should wear them. It sounds like that's not a recommendation that the state is, is ready to make. So wondering if you could just be a little bit more explicit on why. And then the second question is on ventilators. Um, you've said that we need 10,000 more ventilators, but um, Secretary Galli has said that at the peak we could have 30,000 IC, ICU rooms that need ventilators. So I'm just trying to understand the difference in those numbers if we may need 30,000 rooms with ventilators, but we're only trying to get 10,000, where did those other 20,000 come from? Yeah, and it's the same question you can ask on the 66,000 beds versus the 50,000. And the answer to both the question I posed rhetorically and the question you've asked specifically is phase one versus phase two. So in our phase one planning, I'm looking to secure those 50,000 beds, again, 30,000 coming uh, from within the hospital system, 20,000 beds uh, that we're procuring, by the way, including Sleep Train Arena today, which will provide capacity for 363 beds. So every day we're stacking more of those beds, more of those supports, uh, and going out, as I said, already finding over 4,252 ventilators as part of phase one uh, goal of 10,000. So that's the buckets to which we see things. Uh, we're going to be as creative as possible, and I hope you heard the reference to how we're looking to uh, bridge ventilators and how we're looking uh, to other creative capacity uh, by using uh, other uh, uh, breathing machines and other ventilation capacity uh, to see if we do get to peak uh, that the needs of the vast majority are met. Uh, we, again, are just trying to do our best and we're leaning in. Uh, there is simply not a purveyor of ventilators in the world that probably hasn't already received a call directly from me or the team. Uh, we are searching high and low all across the globe. Uh, I mentioned the capacity of purchasing the state has, the 101 million N95 masks uh, that we uh, have uh, requested or actually gone through a purchase order for. It gives you a sense of the scope and scale of what we're looking to do um, from a global perspective. So we'll keep at it. Uh, again, the whole point is to buy more time. And as long as we're the lower end of that curve, that will give us more days, more weeks, give us this next month. Uh, to be able to find those additional ventilators. I should just note, 
in conclusion on the vents, we specifically have a request into the federal government for 10,000 ventilators. But I'm not naive. I think that's their entire stock for the United States. They're also trying to source more ventilators. But we've had that request in for some time. And so that goes specifically to where are we going to get those additional 10,000. If indeed that happens, that would be spectacular. Uh, but California is resourceful, and we're not waiting around uh, for others. We're going to try to figure this out. And every day that we do, I will update you so you'll have more information. Um, as it relates to the first part of your question, I'll have Dr. Galley answer because I've now forgotten it. Forgive me. Can, what was it? Can you repeat the yeah, question? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> We may have lost. Well, we'll answer it next time. But, there we go. Yeah. Forgive me. I got focused on the ventilators. Let me thank everybody um, for uh, their time and attention. And Kathleen will happily answer that question. We can do that offline right after. And um, all of you uh, will continue to provide more information, more real-time information, continue to update our model. I hope everybody realizes and respects the dynamic nature of all the modeling, all the data. Uh, it changes by the hour, by the day, including the number of deaths in the state of California. We marked this morning of 171 deaths in this state. We already have reports of others uh, just in the last number of hours. So with all that in mind, let me just thank everybody again uh, for their incredible contribution in terms of their personal uh, capacity to meet this moment through appropriate uh, physical distancing. Uh, we are committed uh, to meeting this moment uh, over the long haul, uh, not just in the short run. And I want to continue, every, everybody continue to encourage you to do what you've done so that we've gotten to this point where we have bought time and time is our friend. That curve is our enemy. Let's bend it. Thank you.